Here's what's next on the Nice Guys on Business. Absolutely. And market conditions, you know, that's always the one thing you could have all the passion, all the ideas, all the actions, and the market can shift. It's happened to me many times in business. And then you have to be able to either shift with it or get into a different marketplace. And, and those kind of things are really hard in the business marketplace. And that's one of the things that I've learned in, in coaching football in a game, something happens, somebody does something that you never expected, and now you have a choice. You could either stand there and take it and lose, or you can adapt and try to figure out a way to be successful. Low. And he walks the bases loaded on 12 straight pitches. How can the nice guys lay out pitches that close? Need an education on how to grow your business? The nice guys are here to help. Learn about great customer service, networking, and how just being nice can help you prosper. Now, here are your hosts, Doug Sandler and Strickland Bonner. Welcome back. Welcome back. It is another week. It is another week. Funkin' fans, my name is Strickland Bonner on the other side of the mic, Mr. Doug Sandler. You know, Doug, we've talked about this before. Some people live for the weekends. Yeah. I, yeah. I live for the week. Because yeah, I, I like what I do. I mean, yeah. I don't hate the weekends, you know, but and and we get more episodes of the nice guys. And, you know, plenty of episodes. And we actually have a, a bonus episode. Are we going to release that this week or is that going to be next week? Do is you that think? the plan? We're going to do it as a bonus. So it's going to be actually six episodes this week. <laughs> I'm good. I'm down with that. It's all good. Uh, are they sick of us yet? I keep thinking, what is what? How many episodes is too many episodes. Strick, why don't we go into seven days a week? We're, that's not going to happen. Don't even go there. <laughs> the only way we go seven days a week is if Saturday and Sunday are our classic reissue episodes because nah, I'm not I, recording more. I don't know. I don't know if anybody wants to hear the classic rewind of... Uh, that you know, part, we, but did we did do we, one yeah, bonus episode yeah. where we re-released episode number one we got a couple of our regular Funkin' fans on the Slack group say, hey, it was really fun and entertaining. But it's yeah. not like we got a lot of feedback of people saying, hey, it was really cool. You got to do more of that. So you know what? If hey, you guys uh, want more of that, tell us. Otherwise, fuck it. We're not doing it. Let me remind you, we don't get a lot of feedback about anything. Exactly. Right? That's the whole point. That's what I'm trying to say. If you people want us to do something, all you got to do is tell us. But you got to reach out and tell us. For a group of fans that are that are extremely engaged when we are actually reaching out to you directly on Facebook or Twitter or our Slack group, that's exactly how pathetic you guys are. We're going to talk about this more tomorrow. We have an interview, Dave Schumann, today. I don't uh, want to get off on okay. that tangent because All right. da All right. Dave has yeah. a million and a half Twitter followers. So obviously, he's probably got more engaged fans than we do, I'm guessing. In uh, I don't see. That's the problem. I don't think he has more engaged fans than we have with his uh, with his company NUC NUC Sports, right? NUC yes, yeah. NUC uh, Sports. I don't think that he has any more engaged a following than we have when it comes to. I I think that I, I think what it come what it really what it's happened. I can't get my thoughts together. Apparently, it's you Monday. Can't talk. I can't it's get Monday. my thoughts together. right. Wake up. I think the cross pollination between podcast to social media is not our strength. Where our strength really is is let's let's engage our our Funkin fans, nice guy community, our ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back, welcome backers. <laughs> Let, if you if you actually go over to Twitter and we and we communicate with them, they're really good at getting back to us. I'm telling yeah. you, I do that all week long. Okay. Getting somebody to come from the from the podcast over to social media, there is some missing link. Well, when and you're chatting with them on Twitter, are they specifically talking about the podcast? Can you at least get feedback from the podcast on Twitter? Or are they just if, talking to you on Twitter because they want to talk to you on Twitter? No, if I ask them a direct question about the podcast, they'll almost always know the answer i, oh, I mean okay. not like not not like what is your <laughs> what attire would you prefer on two, your two optional <laughs> right course. right uh, of course if you it got an invite be, if yeah. it wouldn't be that no. but because that would actually prove that they listen to the show <laughs> but we do have an engaged they engage us by by reaching out to us like hey love the episode with such and such and i'm like fuck we're, we're, all we're asking that same person to do is listen to the podcast. You know what it is? I think we put out so so many episodes that by the time they hear it on the podcast, it's like three or four weeks later. Do you? Do you, what focus, percentage? Focus. This is interesting. What? What? <laughs> what? What? Mar? Focus. Focus. Wait, is focus. that's a. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, is that the drop or is that actually It's Mark? a new, I got a new drop because here was the original drop. Come on, focus guys, focus. <laughs> focus. Like, that, and Mar pointed out that it sounds like, it's a, it's a little, it's a little angry. It's a little, little forceful and she's not like that, right? Okay. She's like real. So I so got a new one. what's the new one? What's the new one? Focus, focus. <laughs> focus. It's like, I, I think I just need to turn the volume up a bit because she's like whispering. Focus, focus. <laughs> 
Now, it's funny because the forceful one, she actually says it three times. And if you hear the third one, she starts yeah. laughing and it, it makes it, it tempers the whole thing. Here, listen. Wait, wait. Come on. Focus, guys. Focus. Focus. <laughs> you see what she does? The problem is yeah, by the time she yeah, gets to the third yeah. one, you and I are laughing over it. So we don't even hear it usually. <laughs> yeah. But now I have two. When Mars uh, not here, she's still here. N U C Sports on. Wait, Camp wait, wait. Difference. We'll, we'll get to Dave. David. Into, I know. We'll get to David. <laughs> I hope he's a good guy. I've already cursed, and we're already <laughs> rambling, and have barely talked about him. Dude, he works with professional athletes and athlete and professional aspiring professional athletes. Okay. You know that he's dealing with a locker room full of locker room talk. All right, fair my, enough. My question is, though, and maybe you know the answer. Maybe we can chat about this more tomorrow. But I think I just I think I just had a reality, a realization of what may be going on with our community. Oh yeah. We put out such an enormous amount of content, Strickland. True. That if today we are releasing the show, when do you think on average somebody is going to be listening to that podcast? Now, the hardcore fans have kept up with us straight along, and those are the ones that are on our Slack group, and those are the ones that I that we get feedback from, I believe, on a regular basis. Somebody listening to an episode today. Mm-hmm. When are they actually, we recording today, sorry, an episode that we're recording today, when are they actually going to be listening to it? It might okay. be a month later. I'll give you my history of, of pod, the way I listen to podcasts. Now, I don't listen to very many that post five days a week. I don't think I listen to any that post five days a week. But typically, well, stupid enough yeah, to do that? if I step away from a podcast for a couple of weeks, yeah. when I go back and listen to one, I listen to the most recent. Oh. And usually, if, if I really liked it, I may go back and listen to last week's or listen to the week before, but I, and everybody's different. I'm curious to hear what other people do, right? If I miss four weeks in a row, I'm typically not going to go back and listen to the four week ago and the three week. Ago. I'm going to start with the most recent because I want it to be timely. I, that's, that's again, that's different than the way I do it. Like yeah. I listen to a show called We Have, We Are, uh, We Have Concerns. No, we Have Concerns, right? Thank you. When I listen, if I've missed for three or four weeks, which I've had many times, I don't want to, because sometimes it's a continuing story or sometimes they make reference. Like one of the guys, uh, his wife had a baby. So I didn't, I, I didn't want to like, I don't want to spoil it by listening to a more recent episode. I want to build up to it. It's almost like a, a oh, timeline. It's interesting, though, because you're right. When I think about it, like, I listen to Dan Savage, Savage Lovecast. I've been listening to that one a lot. I really, really like it. And at the end of the episode, like, he answers a lot of listener questions, right? At the end of the episode, he usually has people call in and and comment about the previous week's episode. They're like, hey, Dan, I just wanted to make a comment about the caller from last week that did this and this and this and this. And you're right. When I listen backwards, it's like, okay, I don't know what that reference is about. So, it, so it's all yeah. about what is the content because you're right. If we have concerns, which I'm adding we have concerns right now to my playlist because you talk about it all the time and I really want to listen. Yeah, it's a fun. It's fun. It's it's thoughtless. It's kind of like ours. You don't really have a, we don't have a storyline that we have to follow. It's not like uh, This American Life and that you really need to follow and listen carefully. Like you could probably pick up our episode at any particular point. Yeah, If you're forwarding past everything in the beginning and you're missing this, you're not going to miss much. No, you're not going to miss much. No. I, you know what? As a matter of fact, if you have not listened since episode one, you really haven't missed a lot. <laughs> no, you really haven't. Just jump in anywhere. It doesn't Just matter. Just jump in anywhere. <laughs> doesn't matter. It does, and it doesn't get any better, by the way. Dan Schumann is our guest today. Dave, and he has football Dave, camps. Dave, Dave Schumann. <laughs> Dave, yo, Dave's not here, man. Sorry. Dave's not here. Sorry. That was Wait, an what? old Cheech and Chong reference. Uh, okay. Um, football camps, combines, and showcase events for recruiting exposure. He's built a great business of this. What I love about it with, with Dave is he's all about bootstrapping it, right? Like people talk about, I listen to a bunch of other business podcasts and they talk about like, oh, how do you get angel funding and how do you get VCs and how do you attract them? Like, you know, didn't isn't Twitter like when Twitter went public, right? Didn't they say it won't be profitable for five years or 10 years or something ridiculous? Like, Okay, when you get funding, hundred thousand yeah. dollars or a million dollars or something, right? Like, not only are you obviously beholden to that, and yes, there are certain industries where you have to have some huge amount of seed money. We've talked to some people that do like like fabric, you know, the fashion industry. You kind of got to have a big chunk of seed money, right? But if you're in an industry where you don't absolutely positively have to have that, there's so much to be said for bootstrapping because you are not giving up. First of all, any piece of your business. The other thing is it makes you a approach the business differently because you've got to start making money right away. And, and that can be a good thing. 
well, what was so great about the conversation that I had with Dave is is he really did it a couple of ways. First way that he did it was through just delivering exemplary service, amazing service, and then followed up by incredible results. So he was getting he was training all of these um, these high school athletes that wanted to move on to either the pros or whatever the next step is with college. And uh, he was getting great results. So as a result of that and, and great service and great follow-up and great communication skills, it, it, see, most people that are in the athletics world, they do, they're just not great communicators. You know, they think it's all about how great you are at doing your job and, and, and relatively little to do with actually how you communicate how great you are with your job. So he really did a good job of explaining how communication, how relationship building, because when I first saw his um, his uh, his Twitter following, it was I was like, what the heck? This guy's got over a million followers on uh, on Twitter. And then I saw how great a communicator that he and his team are. And uh, I thought this guy, even though it's sports and not directly, you know, something that's focused on on business, I I thought it was just a really good opportunity to get somebody that's outside of our normal business guy uh, to to get him to explain how he did this through athletics and uh, and did a great job. So uh, really really cool guy to have on the show today. And and his business plan works. I mean his his website nucsports dot com. He's had over ten thousand athletes get scholarships right and there are currently 300 <laughs> nfl players that got yeah. their start at nuc sports events that, that's amazing i mean you don't realize how elite it is to become an nfl athlete i mean you think about the guys that just get like a college scholarship and then it's an incredibly small percentage that ever make it into the nfl 300 nfl players went through nuc sports and that's uh, kind of amazing yeah we talk about how to uh how to get and keep staff how to uh, how to treat your staff once you have them how to treat your clients uh communication essential in order to be successful and and what it's like to to bootstrap you know he's got i forget some crazy number like twenty thousand kids that go through his or athletes that go through his his program on i think like a quarterly basis well yeah. he'll explain all the all the demos of his uh of his group when he uh when he his when we do the interview in just a couple of minutes but just a very very cool guy down to earth guy really extremely over the top success and uh um loved loved having a chance to interview dave so um let's get to that interview oh did please we do, don't forget uh, inter- overcast we yeah. need recommendations on overcast just we know you're listening on overcast just click on the little star recommend button every individual episode we are number one in business because of you guys right now on overcast and we fucking love that tim ferris is looking up our ass okay <laughs> and all the other i mean the little engine that could all right that's us and it's all because of you guys we love it please keep up the great work please keep recommending us on overcast and just one final uh, reminder we have a, a reach goal here i know this is monday show so we're going to tell you what our goal is uh in the month of june we went over seven hundred thousand downloads <laughs> where as of the Crazy. Uh, the time that this comes out, I think we're going to be around 710,000 uh, downloads. 100 days, in 100 days, we will be over 1 million downloads. It's a little bit of a stretch, but I know based upon the trends that we have, we are going to get there. So 1 million downloads. You guys could say that you're a part of a 1 million download show. Just get involved either through patreon.com forward slash nice guys, recommend the episode, Overcast, uh, help review the show, any way that you feel like it would be great to support us. You can even just reach out and just say hi. How about that? That would be very cool just to we say hi. We need like 100,000 downloads every month for the next three months to get that. I we, we're gonna I think do we it. can do it. We I, need your help though. Tell your friends, tell your friends, friends, I please. think based upon the trend that we're heading in, uh, Strick, we have this growth rate. Uh, it's anywhere between 10 and 20% every month. I don't see, I, and there are there are shows that are higher than us in the overall category. So it doesn't. It means that we have not completely saturated Overcast. We are going to be one of the only shows that does it with less than ten percent of our download count coming from iTunes. I don't know if any show has ever done that. I know. I think you know we are the little engine that could. You know, fuck iTunes. We don't. Need that. <laughs> Jesus. I mean, we kind of need them, I guess. But you know, whatever. Nobody, nobody from iTunes is listening to this anyway. Oh, you're scaring me a little Overcast, bit. Overcast, dude. We love Overcast. Who, it, who runs Please iTunes? Go. Is it the same? Is it the Apple. same guy that runs Apple? Runs yeah. iTunes? I mean, is it like the same exact? Like, there's no like like category like like <laughs> president or. Can Vice we get to President the interview with Technology. Dave? <laughs> Could we please get to the interview with Dave at some yeah. point? All right, let's get to the interview. Dave Schumann, NUC Sports, right here on the Nice Guys on Business Podcast. Proud to be affiliated with a whole bunch of networks. <laughs> let's just move on. Let's go. <laughs> 
If bootstrapping successfully had had a poster child, uh, it, it might well possibly be David Schumann. David has a, he's built a million dollar business and he has probably uh, every up and down experience that you can imagine with his company called NUC Sports. Here to share a bit of his journey today and his uh, and all of his techniques, or a lot of his techniques. Welcome, David, to the Nice Guys on Business podcast. Uh, nothing better than being on with you guys. You won't know this, David, but my Nice Guy community definitely knows this. I'm not much of a sports guy, but there's an exception. When I see a lot of crossover between what you've done in your sports career, in your sports world, and then turn that into a success in business... Then I start to see some relatability. So can you share a little bit about what NUC is and a couple of maybe your successes and introduce yourself in the process? Yeah, NUC uh, evolved into a company that really focuses on helping young athletes get recruited for college through different events that we run uh, within the football space primarily. Um, that, that's, that's the nuts and bolts of it. Um, we, where we got to that point, uh, we came from, I had owned a training facility. I had at one point had three different training facilities uh, under a different name and uh, eventually stumbled on to uh, NUC Sports running a football showcase for, for local athletes. And uh, the light bulb went off and thought there could be something there and, and to really build it. But it was from my, uh, you know, two things from my football my passion for football, um, I, I still coach football to this day, and, and the second part was um, my desire to provide an opportunity um, and, and give something back. That, that too kind of matched from that area and, and, and morphed into NUC Sports. I mean, what what it really impressed me so much as you talk about that is really been your success re- record. I mean, you've trained, uh, and just looking at some of the stats, you've trained over 30,000 athletes through your program. I'm sure that you've seen and you've met and you've dealt with every type of personality. Is there is there something common that you see that makes a successful candidate, whether it be in business or, or in the sports world? Yeah, I mean, we, we see almost 20,000 athletes per year over the last 10 years, so uh, – from a characteristic standpoint, athletically, I mean, the desire to be successful, the determination, and the ability to put action, um, not just have goals, but to put action to those goals is, is a key thing. It's been a key thing for for me when I was an athlete as a coach and, and, and building this business from literally the ground up. Uh, I had changed career shortly after 9-11. I was in the uh, business tech space. Uh, and that's one of the areas that I used to help build my business. Um, but then I actually really focused in that in that football area and, and, and bootstrapped and really built it from zero. I didn't really have much money. I had a loan originally uh, from uh, for three thousand dollars from one of my friends from high school and started from there. Um, it morphed into NUC sports over the years and, and developed into one of the biggest programs in the country. But that determination and the ability to put action to it and identify opportunities and the ability to be flexible and kind of roll with the punches because as an entrepreneur, um, yeah. your passion is important, but your ability to adapt and to roll with the punches is way more important. Oh, I couldn't agree any more uh, with you than that. Talk about the difference or maybe the comparison between somebody that's got raw talent versus somebody that's got acquired talent. Which, which one would you rather have on your uh, on your team? Well, you got to have some raw talent. I mean, that's that's important uh, in in order. It, it, and I always say that it, it varies levels of success for you. So you have caps based off of that raw talent. So if someone is a starts out at a seven, maybe they can get to a 10. Um, if someone is starts out as a four, maybe they can get to an eight or nine. Uh, but you want to kind of match both. I mean, that's always the key. But someone who has talent, they may only stay at that seven. You might start out with someone that's a five, and they can take it all the way up to that level 10. And that's op- optimally what you want is someone that has some level of talent uh, that you can then mold and, and really develop and that willingness to do that, that willingness to just grind and put in the work is, is the key. 
I, and I, and I think that that is the key word, that willingness to do it. I can't tell you how many times, and I own an entertainment company, and how many times I have these guys that are so freaking talented. I mean, they have this major talent. They just can't show up on time, or they have this amazing, uh, ability to win over a crowd quickly at the event. Um, but they, um, but they don't want to rehearse and they don't want to be a team player. How important is, is the fact that you got to be a team player play into the overall success of somebody, do you think? Well, I think if you don't learn what it takes to be success from, uh, successful from other leaders and other mentors, then you won't be able to handle things as it comes down the pike uh, in business or, or in sports when you have to go then and adapt. And, you know, we, we talked about that willingness to be able to be successful, to do what's necessary to be successful. That is so important. So many people have – I always laugh when people tell me they have this great idea, you know, uh, people maybe that – that might uh, be on the outside, even sometimes that work for me. And they say, I have this idea, we should do this. I say, well, that idea is great, but now we've got to take marketing, sales, uh, <laughs> operations. Are you going to be the one driving that idea or did you just come up with the idea and just throw it up against the wall? I mean, and, and it's funny, but as a business owner, I always, I always laugh at the fact that someone will say, I have this great idea. And I say, you know, I have – reams of paper <laughs> of ideas that I've had that I've yeah. never ever enacted many of which other people have gone on to do but I didn't you know have that desire to go and make that idea a reality you know I like when people say oh I had the idea for Uber or I had the idea for Snapchat but it was, it was the owners of Uber or Snapchat or any of these other companies that went and enacted on that idea and made it a reality ideas uh, are worth absolutely nothing if there's no action behind them. A hundred percent. Oh my gosh, it's so funny. I always tell everybody I'm I'm not short of ideas. I'm just short of the time to implement the ideas. And part of that, really, and I never even thought about it the way that you're presenting it. Part of it is you have to have all these other components. You, you you can be a great big picture guy, but unless you have the small picture people that can put the details together or the detailed people, it, it's going to fall flat on its face, or it's going to fall flat on its idea. Absolutely. And market conditions, you know, that's always the one thing you could have um, all the passion, all the ideas, all the actions and the market can shift. It's happened to me many times in business. And then you have to be able to either shift with it or get into a different marketplace. And, and those kind of things are really hard um, in, in the business marketplace. And it's one of the things that I've learned in, in coaching football for so many years and playing sports is that uh, in a game, something happens, somebody does something that you never expected, and now you have a choice. You could either stand there and take it and lose, or you can adapt and try to figure out a way to be successful. And and that adaptability is, is, is so important in business. I've had, since I started my company back in 2002, was, I was originally training athletes out of, out of my truck, just doing speed and quickness <laughs> training. And then it yeah. evolved into a training facility, then evolved into NUC Sports. So it's constantly evolving. And my program is always constantly evolving because somebody sees something you do real well. And what do they do? They jump into that marketplace. And now your market share might get eroded, especially if you don't have – you know, when you're someone like me who's always bootstrapping stuff, if you don't have that huge amount of uh, backing in it, you have to be able to adapt in order to be successful as a small business owner. Well, and how do you compete? Because you you got a company. Let, let's say that you and I, and I don't know this to be a, a real life example, but I'm going to play the, paint the scenario for you. You've created a great training system. You've created a great program. You've bootstrapped everything, and you have these great ideas. And you get somebody that comes through your program, and then they go to a Nike training facility, or they go to Reebok or Adidas or any of the big name, you know, the big box big brands. And they clobber you from a financial perspective because they can invest millions, hundreds of millions of dollars. How do you compete on a on an equal playing field with a with a company that has deep pockets when you're bootstrapping everything? I mean, for me, part of it's experience. So the experience that they have with us is critical. If that experience is good or bad, it's going to have ramifications for us. So we have to be able to give the customer experience that's very good and different than they might have from an, another event. And our follow-up has to be real, real important, how we continue to follow up. You know, 
the standard things like customer service is important, but not just answering everything from a customer st- service standpoint. Because people always think in the business, I, I you know, I, I laugh when Zappos says, you know, uh, we have, well, we have a, a client service man, customer service manager. Well, you know, they they're on a mass market scale standpoint. Yeah, we yeah. have uh, I, we have scale, but we don't have mass market scale. So. Our customers have to be a certain type of clientele that fit what we're looking to accomplish and what they're looking to accomplish. So not everybody's a fit for us. Um, and then the other thing is that when we have our, our programs, tweaking our programs so they're different. Now, mm-hmm. what does happen? Obviously, competitors see that you have success. They copy continuously tweaking your programs and staying yeah. ahead of the curve. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I can see that for sure. And I can see that that you guys probably do things. You have to do it a little bit differently. You have to be nimble and light and quick uh, to be able to, to make those turns quickly in business. Translate translate success on the playing field or from the playing field into the boardroom. Who are your most successful staff members? I don't mean names wise, but I mean, like what what personality traits or what kind of people are the best staff members for you and, and what makes them successful? Because I'm assuming that you're not doing this all on your own. You have a, a, a pretty good staff. Yeah. So one of the things with us is we have seasonal staff because of the nature of some of our programs. And, and there's two kind of key sets that that I look for. One is somebody that can handle things on their own. I, I know it sounds crazy uh, to say something like because it sounds simple, but I have found that finding people that work for you that can handle things on their own is very, very hard to find. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. That you don't have to tell them every, you know, be texting back and forth all day and minimizing your production because they can't be productive without you holding their hand. That's right. a that's the number one most important quality that I look for. That self sufficiency, somebody that you can give a task to and they figure it out. Uh, and the second thing is willing to listen, learn, and then act. You know, that's all one thing. To listen to what you're trying to get accomplished, for them to learn about what what you're you're trying to get done, and then to be able to act on that. Those two key things are critical. And then the third, a, a subset of that is. Any person that can bring in business is is gold. Um, <laughs> it, you know, it, it's funny. Rainmaker. You like the rainmaker, right? Yep. Guys who can bring in business and bring customers, you really – you want to – you know, if you can, take care of those guys to your to your very best ability because the truth is and, – and it's taken a long time for guys to work with me. Everybody that works for you, you're investing in and there's a cost to that. And if they don't bring in dollars, then that investment is just purely a cost. So I try to encourage people to work for me is to say, hey, we pay you to do do a job for us. Well, you know what? You could pay for yourself many times over by bringing customers or referring customers uh, to, to what we do. So that's real important. The other thing I found that's really interesting is that sports sets you up to handle adversity and to handle – um, what might be thrown at you, but the workforce and, and the business landscape to me is so much more competitive on a day to day basis. When we get mm-hmm. ready for a game, we're preparing for one game each week, or we might be preparing for a whole season. Um, when you're in business, every single day you wake up, it's a new competition yeah. every yeah. single day. Yeah, I, I agree with that. And and what's interesting about what you said a little bit earlier, you were talking about you have to have the ability as a as somebody that works um, in your organization to be able to be empowered to make the decisions right then and there and react and be and be your own guy and be your own leader. Just as importantly, and and maybe I just would love to hear your comments on this. Just as importantly. To have a, a a leader or somebody within the organization in management or ownership that lets staff make decisions and lets staff fail if that means, hey, listen, yeah, it wouldn't have been the decision I made, but damn it, you made a decision. And, and okay, I appreciate the fact that you made a decision. Can you just talk about that for a second is in terms of just a, a management style or an ownership style? Yes. Uh it, it's critical to be able to do that. You know, one of the things that people have worked for me, um, the ones who have been most successful realize that I'll give responsibility out 
and I'll let them run with it and make decisions. And then I'll coach them from that point forward. And if they're not able to uh, run with it, if they're not able to take the bull by the horns, if they're not able to make decisions and make some mistakes on their own, they will be guys that eventually get worked out of the system. And yeah. it's yeah. one of those interesting things. Um, I've had people that have come to me and said, uh, I, you know, you're not telling me what to do. Uh, I need to know what to do. I need to, if I hear that, I know that very shortly those people will not be working for me much longer because right, if right. they can't do things on their own, I want them to have good communication back and forth, but I need them to be able to be able to make decisions, to figure things out and not just rely on the owner or the founder or some of the leaders within the organization to do everything for them. Um, those people don't work for me. And I think, you know, when you when you look at even large corporate entities, the people that are able to operate in autonomy are the most successful, the people who need someone to always constantly um, tell them what to do have a problem. And it's when when guys that work for me say, hey, um, you know, you're you're not you're not constantly contacting me to tell me uh, what to do or blah, blah, blah. Then I said, then that means that you're you know right now you're doing a good job. If I say, hey, great camp or great evaluation, um, and and I don't have a lot of other stuff unless you need some kind of feedback, that means that you're on the right track. Yeah, uh, yeah. If you constantly say, hey, what should I do here? Or what should I do here? Or what should I do here? Then you're someone that can't make decisions, and you're not someone that can can't can take action and if you can't make decisions you can't take action it's going to be very short order before you're no longer on my team talk about talk about um you you've plastered all over your website information about grit gut perseverance talk about that um as a part of the important um aspects of of how do you get to success because it can't just be all about having a good skill set it's got to be about taking chances being you know gritty having some guts to do it and definitely persevering so in 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 sports especially i see that uh as as prevalent but can you talk about that overall in both business and uh and in sports yeah i mean from from a, from a sports standpoint the ability to persevere it's another word i absolutely love uh, the ability to persevere is critical uh, because you have adversity in, in any kind of thing in sport and some you have different levels of talent. And so the ability to persevere as an athlete is, is critical. The same thing is true in business. You know, one of the things I have my MBA uh, from the University of Connecticut. And I was lucky enough because I was playing football there that I was able to get the first year of my MBA paid for because uh, I was on scholarship. And it was interesting because I was one of the youngest uh, people in that MBA program. Most people go and work for several years, then they go and get their MBA. And one of the things that coming out being young, what I didn't really know is that um, I thought that, okay, my education will be able to help me in the jobs that I have to be successful. And what I realized is that the people who relied on education, I realized is a very short order – those mm -hmm. people who relied on the fact that they had X set of knowledge and that would carry them, those people did not move up in, in companies they worked in. Right. And what I realized uh, very quickly, and the, the guy who brought me in, my very first job uh, after I was an MBA, uh, I worked for this company called IMC. They've, they've since been sold a couple of years ago for, uh, I think, half a billion uh, dollars. <laughs> but at the time, the company was only like a $50 million company. And that CEO was an alma mater of, of my school. And, and he said the more that you can get involved on in the business development side, the more that you can learn and not just have your technical knowledge yeah. but interact with people, the better off you'll be. And I watched my career in the tech space skyrocket during that initial dot-com boom and then bust. And it taught me a lot because guys who from that bus period in the dot-com era, um, that initial dot-com, a lot of the younger people don't re remember that stuff, but but I, I know it real well. Uh, they were stuck on their technical knowledge. They built websites. They coded in, in, in C++ or they coded in HTML, and they never continued to adapt their knowledge base. They never yeah, continued yeah. to adapt their skill set. And they struggled getting jobs during the bus period. The people who had 
what we call soft soft skills with personal uh, personal ability to talk with people and communicate. Those people continue to develop their skill sets, and that learning is critical in business because business is always evolving. New competitors come in, new competitors go, and you know people always say, uh, um, "Well, this company is so successful. Google's successful. Apple's successful." Well, you know, at one time there was Standard Oil, which there is no such company <laughs> called Standard Oil, yep, yep. which is owned by the Rockefellers, which is the most wealthiest family. But that company is no longer in existence. Um, th- there's all kinds of companies that you can go and point to that uh, the horse and carriage is no longer in existence once Ford and invented right. the car. And, and there's companies all over the place that go in and out. And the ability to adapt is the key because – you may have to adapt your product. You may have to adapt your service. You may have to overhaul your whole entire business. I've taken business units that I've had, and I don't get married to them. You know, I, I from an ego standpoint, you love what you've built, but you can't get caught up in a product that you have, or even maybe even sometimes a business, in order to ultimately be successful. You have to be able to adapt and continue to figure out. Uh, what your skill set is, what you need to continue to learn to to be successful, and that might be in the company I have. Fifteen years from now, you, if we're talking again, I might be owning a different company. Right, right. And, and as a good friend of mine, uh, Jeffrey Hazlett would say, it is adapt, change, or die. Uh, and it, it is, it's just simple. I mean, it's the whole Kodak model. I mean, Kodak was not in the business of making film. They were in the business of making memories, and, and they were stuck in the film world, and that's why they went out of business. They forgot that they were memory makers. They weren't filmmakers. Kodak should have been Facebook. Well, <laughs> Facebook <laughs> is right. now Kodak. You're right. Right? You're so right. It, You're right. And everything You're else, right. obviously, in between. But that, it's, that's it, so interesting that's, to say that's that. That's 100% the truth, no doubt about hey, it. Hey, but be, before we wrap up, Dave, and I, I really appreciate you going a little overtime with me. Before we wrap up, I want to talk about technology for a second because you have this huge social following in the millions. And how did you make that happen? And, and how has that really aided you? Well, that's one of the things that I actually learned. So if I, if I go way back to when I was in grad school, I had started um, – I, I can't say that I'm proud of it now, but at the time I had a term paper writing company. Okay. And, uh, <laughs> well, it's yes. something to be proud of. You yeah. built a business. <laughs> yes. And, 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 yes, absolutely. And in um, 1998, we did 144000 in sales uh, with that term paper writing company, and it was completely built online. I built the, the site myself. I taught myself HTML um, over winter break uh, at school in my MBA program, put the site up. And all of a sudden, customers were coming. And I, I took ads out of a company called – I think it was called GoTo.com at the time. Okay. And I paid for ads and I got more customers and started building the business. It was actually building it uh, beyond what we could handle that time. We were handling – we were getting voicemails on our on our phone and, and people were like, are you going to call us back because we were getting so many voicemails. Yeah. And um, it's one of those things where – I then, when Google Ads came out, I learned that. And when Twitter, uh, that was one of the ways I had built my business. And then Twitter, when it really started to take off, I was able to identify it as a really good opportunity to build that following because um, I was a member of Facebook very early on in 2005 and was utilizing it. And when Twitter came out, I jumped right all on it on 2008, 2009 time period and uh, really tried to build my following and make my Twitter page a source of information for yeah, my yeah. customer base. Right, it, right. It grew like wildfire. It, it literally grew like wildfire. You know, now it's a lot tougher to build your following um, than maybe it was in, in, in back then. But I was able to kind of identify as things came around the corner, um, I was able to identify – at those kind of opportunities. And I think that might be part of like the talent skill set, like kind of an intuition thing where I'm like, I think this is a good thing. You know, I'm one of the people that have always said that I'm not so sure about Snapchat because um, for a business owner, I still, you know, if I'm a celebrity, I'm a Kardashian. Yeah, I could, I get it. But if I'm a business owner and I'm trying to build uh, a brand, I think the uh, scalability on it is very, very difficult. 
without investing your majority of your time there. And I don't know if that's feasible for a lot of businesses. So, well, you, you certainly have done it very well and successfully on uh, on Twitter. I can I can attest to that just in watching some of your and you and it's an engaged community too. I know it's hard to engage a million and a half people, but man, you you're on it all the time. Or maybe you have a team of people that are working it with you. Uh, in either case, you do it successfully. So uh, well done, Dave. Thank you. Hey, so uh, before we wrap up, I'm very curious, and I don't know if this is a part of your offering, what you have that's out there in the world as part of your, the services that you that you provide outside of the the sports world. But I know I've got to have a lot of um, a lot of sports uh, um, uh, fanatics in our audience that would love to use the theories and the practices and the tactics that you have in business. Is do you do any consulting from that perspective? I do if it's contacted to me. Um... I have a podcast that I do called Success for Life, which we ran all last summer into the fall, and we start in uh, late July, early August again this year, where I do a lot of uh, interviews um, and discussions about different things in business and what has actually made people successful. Um, but yes, you can always reach me at David Um and I'm glad to help anybody from a business standpoint. Uh, I, I'm glad to coach them, and uh, you know, on a one-off consulting basis, I operate a business, so I, you know, would be select on, on who I work with. But absolutely, that's that's awesome. That's awesome. We'll make sure that we put our uh, all of your uh, your contact information in our show notes as well. Dave, thank you so much for being a part of the community. Thanks for reaching out to me and and accepting my invitation to to come on the show. Definitely valuable information and a great guest. Thanks for being here. Thank you very much. Hey, Nice Guy community, never underestimate the value of nice. Again, special thanks to Dave Schumann for being a part of the group. All of his information in the show notes about NUC and how to get a hold of him and to check out his podcast as well. Steve O'Brien, go ahead and take us out of here. For Doug Strickland, the Nice Guys on Business podcast, I'm Steve O'Brien. Yo, bartender, Joe Boo needs a refill. 